Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Future of Space. I'm your host, Daniel Fox. Our guest today is Dr. George C. Neal. George has worked as an Air Force officer, a NASA manager, and a senior executive at the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation. On March 31st of 2021, he flew on board New Shepard as part of Blue's Origin's fourth human space flight. Dr. George, welcome to the future of space. Thank you, Daniel. I appreciate you having me on today. How are you today on this beautiful afternoon? Doing well, thank you. Good. Now, before we go on into your journey into space and your flight with Blue Origin, could you share with us three words that capture the essence of space for you? Sure. I would say the first word for space for me is breathtaking. That is certainly an appropriate word to describe one's reaction when you see the beauty of the earth in the context of our, our universe. Uh, a second word might be inspirational. If we look back thousands of years, people have been looking up to the sky and seeing the sun and the moon and the stars and the planets and that has encouraged them to try and learn and understand and explore and discover and have some context for are we alone and what's the meaning of life, all those kinds of things. I think that's going to continue going forward. And then the third word would be transformational. We think about all that we have done in or with or from space in the last few decades it's really made a significant impact on our daily lives in terms of how we communicate, how we navigate, how we get our entertainment, how we grow crops, how we do financial transactions. And again, I see that continuing in the future in ways that we don't even understand at this point. I mean, for a lot of people, when we talk about space they think of the future of space but really it's the future of our human species in space it's not one at the expense of the other but it's really it's one for the support and elevating the other uh, they work hand in hand would you agree yes very much so now you've been in the industry for 30 years um you've been surrounding yourself with people that believed in that future, what would you say is the human story of uh, going to space? So that's a great question. Let me, let me step back just a little bit and, and talk about uh, why countries have space programs in the first place. And I think there are a number of possible rationales that a government could have for being active in space, and, and they could range from national security, to technological leadership, economic competitiveness, perhaps scientific curiosity, and as an inspiration for students and teachers. So that may explain why governments or space agencies have a space program, but in the last few years, we're seeing companies and wealthy individuals have space programs or space activities too. So why do they want to do that? And I guess my response would be sometimes for many of the same reasons that governments are interested in space, but there's a few other reasons as well. Some strongly believe that it's possible to make money in space. And of course, that can be very difficult at times, but we see a lot of examples where that is successful in terms of uh, telecommunications and uh, other ideas that people have had. Uh, you look at uh, others, they might just have a passion for space and want to try to accelerate the progress that we're making. And some examples there could include Sir Richard Branson, who aspires to have the first global space lines that perhaps can bring people together a little bit and help us to understand other countries and other cultures and other societies. Jeff Bezos has this grand vision for 
millions of people living and working in space to benefit Earth. And Elon Musk is trying to do what he can to help humanity become a multi-planetary species. So those are all pretty bold, ambitious visions for the future, but I think they're representative of the kinds of reasons that, that space has been and can be important to us in the future. I think some of the questions that we that can connect with us is really, you know, why why does life want to go there? Why do we go off the beaten path to find new discoveries? Why did Sir Edmund, Edmund Hillary wanting to go up Everest? Why why did we try to take up the sky, you know, in the 1900s or even get on the water? And I think that there's this inherent curiosity to go to the places where that are visually there for us, but are unattainable. I remember when I was uh, kayaking around uh, the Kodiak Island and paddled for a day and I found myself into this remote island and I put the kayak away, I set up the camp and right after I'm finished setting up the, uh, the tent, this brown bear shows up, you know, through the grass and up to my left, up of the hills, I see the two, like a pair of deer that, that are also there. And for this moment, at that moment, I had this realization that the four of us, the bear, myself and the deer, had consciously or unconsciously left the mainland and had ventured into the unknown or the known, but had, had, had traveled to this place where we were, where we were not that many. And it made me wonder if mammals in general have this innate curiosity to venture beyond the horizon, if it's something that's innate in us, or if it's just something that is part of life, what would you like, what would you say about that? I think there's a lot of truth to that. And not everyone may have that feeling and different people have different reactions to, to risk and, and benefits and exploring and discovering. But uh, that certainly seems to be a part of human nature for many people. Now with space, always an attraction for you. Um, uh, what was the, the these milestones that during your upbringing as a child and to where you are today that kept you on that, made you go on that path and kept you on that path moving forward? So I had my first flight in an airplane when I was just a few weeks old. My father had gotten his pilot's license and took my mother and me up for a ride. And so it was just a small two-seater and the uh, story goes that as the controls were being checked out, the control stick hit me on the head and I cried un uncontrollably. I can't say that I actually remember that event, but uh, used to uh, enjoy flying from Virginia to Wisconsin every summer to see our grandparents and so forth. And then a little later, we started seeing activities in space. And so I was very intrigued by and interested in the, the space chimps and the Mercury astronauts and used to cut out articles from the newspaper and have a scrapbook with all the pictures from Life magazine and all the rest and was following those activities very closely. Um, studied math and science in school and enjoyed those. was trying to figure out if I could be a part of all this. I decided to go to the Air Force Academy to go to school with the thinking that that would be a great place to learn more about aviation and space. It would be a, a challenge for, for me, which I enjoy, and also an opportunity to serve our country. So again, that seemed to be a good fit for me. And then following graduation, had a, a lot of different opportunities, some of which you mentioned, uh, working as a flight test engineer in the Air Force and then working for NASA on the space shuttle program then the commercial space office of the FAA. And each of those was a, a wonderful activity to get to know what was going on in industry and to help contribute, at least in a small way, to us moving forward. And then that led you to NASA and obviously the Air Force. Would you, did you think ever that the, um, 
the opportunity of, of going to space was going to, to present itself for you? So I, I thought about that growing up. Um, I didn't have perfect eyesight. And so that seemed to, to be a, an obstacle in terms of being a military test pilot and following the traditional channels there. But then as a flight test engineer out at Edwards Air Force Base, uh, NASA in developing the space shuttle announced that they were going to have different kinds of people become astronaut mission specialists who were not necessarily military test pilots, but also engineers and scientists and doctors and so forth. And so I applied to become a NASA astronaut, uh, actually made the, the finals twice in that process, but did not make the final cut. Uh, later on, ended up working on the shuttle program as an engineer and a manager and certainly uh, enjoyed that time, got to know a lot of NASA astronauts and the people that were working on the program and found that very re rewarding as well. Um, going forward, uh, did not appear that there were going to be any opportunities to, to personally go myself, but then just in the last year, uh, we've seen that really opening up quite a bit. Uh, Blue Origin about a year ago announced that they were planning to auction off one of the seats on their very first human space flight. And so I raised my hand and filled out some forms and put in a, a bid for the auction. And of course, right away, the price got <laughs> out of this world. And so I said, well, I tried, but uh, a little while later, they got back in touch with me and uh, worked out a, a slot, not on the first flight, but on, on the fourth flight, as it turned out. So uh, really am excited for having had the opportunity to participate personally in this type of activity after having supported human space flight for most of my career. Now, you mentioned transform, uh, transformational. Um, now, we, we know that going to space, um, the, the training up to now has always been more focused on the the technicality of it, the, the, the engineering aspect, the uh, physicality of it, but it's becoming more and more obvious that there's also a spiritual preparation that needs to be done because the, the experience is so powerful. I mean, I was talking to Sharon and Mark, Sharon was saying it's so emotional, powerful. It's the, 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 it's so grand and it's so powerful that if you don't have a framework to really process that information, you can be left kind of wondering what to do with that. How do you think moving forward as we get more and more public um, going up uh, uh, up to space, how important is it going to become to to prepare them mentally and spiritually so that they can get the, the, the most of that experience? That's an interesting question. So different companies have different kinds of vehicles with different training programs. And it's not a one size fits all. And at least so far, there's no requirement that in order to fly, then this is what you have to be interested in. And this is what you have to think about. And this is the way you have to prepare. Blue Origin has decided to implement a, a system that is completely autonomous. And so there is no pilot on board. There's no pilot on the ground. They do have a mission control room with lots of experts engineers and technicians that are watching over the, the data to make sure things are going according to plan. But that's a real difference in terms of how someone has to train or prepare for the flight. It's, it's not steering the vehicle. You're not trying to punch the right buttons and call up the right displays to rendezvous and dock with the space station or, or things like that. Instead, uh, they basically had a, a three full day training program that was more describing about the, the rocket and the capsule itself, uh, the displays, how to use the radio, emergency procedures, and then a lot of time just getting in and out of the capsule and your seat with the harness and so forth, both in terms of a 1G environment before launch and after landing, and how do you buckle those 
harnesses when you're in microgravity. So it was a much different uh, type of, of training than, for example, NASA astronauts have typically again gone through. But as you mentioned, uh, there's a, an emotional, spiritual, very special aspect to all this that, that's really hard to convey if you haven't done it. And so um, that's one of the challenges, I think, is to try to describe what is this experience like and uh, how can you can look at lots of pictures and that doesn't necessarily communicate. Uh, you can have people tell stories of what did it feel like and what did you look at and what did you do and all that. But it's a very, very moving experience um, in, in trying to describe it. You know, people say, well, how was it? It was awesome. And you can go through descriptions of minute by minute. What did you do and how did it feel and so forth? Uh, I encourage future flyers to pay attention to, to what they're seeing, what they're hearing, what they're feeling. But I don't know about you, for, for me, sometimes reading a very special book can be a moving experience that can put you in a different place and help you understand things a little better. If you see a particularly good movie or show, sometimes that can be, wow, you know, that that was something. I'm different today than before I saw that. Or even if you hear some special songs or special kinds of music or symphonies, that can really be moving to me. Or I can get goosebumps or just feel my heart warm. I would say this: the space flight was all of those combined and then taken up a level. It's just really something special. I mean, there's definitely something to be said about these um transformational moments in life there's and i think that in our culture right now we tend often to dismiss the, the necessity for the physicality of these experiences thinking that we they can be replicated either in a virtual reality or just by reading about it but there's a big difference between the theory and the actual experience and there's i think that going outside of that comfort zone when your when your body suddenly reacts and you you didn't anticipate it is part of that experience you know whether it's going on the ocean finding yourself in the middle of you know middle of the ocean during a storm and and really finding this the smallness of who you are and and what you are or and this is the same thing as going up in space we can we can rationalize the we can rationalize the experience we can talk about it but the physicality of the experience the, the feeling the g's and then and then getting up there and understanding that there's something special about it there's something that you should not be there i remember experiencing um when i witnessed the uh, the solar eclipse the total solar eclipse of 2017 i think in in oregon there's a huge difference between the 99% experiencing the solar eclipse on 99% um, um, eclipse and the 100% and being in that path of totality and understanding in that moment why the the societies of the past would go and, sacri and sacrifice whatever they could find because there is something really wrong about having the sun disappear. Like the, you, your mind goes into a place that this should not happen. And I can only imagine going up in, in, a, in a rocket for the first time and suddenly find, seeing the planet and your brain is trying to process all that and having obviously the adrenaline because of the G-force it's it's something that cannot that cannot be replicated just by putting a helmet and, and VR. So that needs to be experienced by I think our world leaders and everybody so that we can we can kind of share that experience. Um, I obviously I think you will agree on that. Yes, very much. And there's a lot of different aspects of that. In our case, we were loaded into the capsule say a half hour before the anticipated launch time and they come around and check your, your harnesses and make sure you're all ready to go and thumbs up everyone. And then the person who's assisting from Blue Origin goes out, they close the hatch 
They climb down seven flights of stairs, hop in a car, and drive a mile away so that if something bad happens on the launch pad, they'll be fine. And then they arm the escape system so that if something bad does happen, then the capsule can be blasted away from the, the booster and come down under a parachute. And so now you're sitting in a nice, reclined, comfortable chair, just the six people on the crew, all by yourselves on this fully fueled rocket, getting a few minutes to reflect on, on life. So yes, that was certainly uh, a special feeling. Uh, during the, the launch portion itself, you're pushed back in your seats. I've heard uh, shuttle astronauts describe the liftoff as, as being like a, a kick in the pants. This was not that way. This was a nice, smooth, but very rapid acceleration up to about three Gs or so. And then after a minute, you get to the maximum aerodynamic pressure or max Q, a little more than two minutes was the main engine cut off. And then about 10 seconds later, bang, as the capsule separates from the booster. And then it was time to unstrap and float around and it was fun to do somersaults and enjoy that, but all of us immediately turned to those huge windows. And without a doubt, the high point of the experience was the view. It's, it's just, I mean, I, I get choked up and, and goosebumps just talking to you about it, to see the curvature of the earth, that thin, bright blue line that is the atmosphere that you are above, and there's this black, black, black sky, blacker than anything that you can imagine. And it is just the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. So you can say, well, I've seen pictures of that. I, I saw a movie. Yeah, it is not the same. It is not the same. You have to experience this and it's awesome. Jim, Jim Kitchen, who was on the, um, on the flight with you, describes the black as this eternal black. It's just a... Apparently, there's so there's something about that black that is so different. I mean, it's a physical black. It's it's you know, and I think we all remember uh, William Shatner coming back and just like black, death, and and blue, and and life, and I it's I I remember watching him it, because here is someone who's trained in processing emotions that's his job while the vast majority yes. of us you know have have to connect the dots he's someone first of all who's been primed all his life with what space the narrative of space and the overview effect and being someone who you know take the emotion of the moment and just amplifies it and create the and create the the, the moment and he's coming back and I will always remember Jeff is right next to him and, you know, he's festive, he's already been over there, but he's caring for the group. He's like, you know, look over there, everybody is celebrating. And, and William is like, dude, hold on. You have no, you have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's these, like, we go back and become that child. And I think that these, it's, I, I find these moments and you were talking and, and I was just, you know, I was getting goosebumps of just imagining that moment of looking out the window and 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 feeling the awe of life and of what it is and how, as a species, we are at that stage now where we're we're doing this. This is becoming a commercial opportunity that obviously is going to be you know becoming more and more available. But the fact that we are there that like 300 years ago the plane was not even invented and now we're flying people yes. to space i mean I've, I've i always get so blown away and full of optimism about the future when i think of yes we have challenges but we are able to achieve the impossible do you still get excited when you think of all of the, the 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 capacities of innovating um innovations that we do? Oh, absolutely. But now more than ever, having had that experience, it has caused me to, to look back and say, okay, here we are. 
61 years after Yuri Gagarin became the first human being to leave the planet. And as of today, there have been 623 people in the whole world who have ever been to space. So, you know, 10 a year on average. I feel very fortunate to be one of those number. But we have to get that number up because it's such an awesome experience that can, can chain you, can move you, can open opportunities for you. What can we do to make this something that more and more people can experience? So how has it changed your life now back? Um, do you find yourself looking at life differently or did you did you change some of your priorities you know moving forward after after the flight um how is different your life post going up as opposed to what it was uh before so that's a question that i, that I get frequently and remember now this this entire flight was only about 10 minutes long and yet it seems so full of different experiences and feelings and emotions and all the rest uh, as I mentioned, I, I think it, it does change you, how you feel about things, how you look at things. And again, I am more committed than ever to, to trying to um, enable more and more people to have this experience. And so it, it caused me to think, so why is that number so small? And as I think about it, well, uh, right now it's pretty costly. And so to the extent that we can get that price down, that'll, that'll certainly help. Uh, there's also a fair amount of risk involved. If you look back at, take the United States as an example, there have been roughly 400 space flights with people on board since we first started doing that. And out of that list, there have been four fatal accidents. One X-15, Space Shuttle Challenger, Space Shuttle Columbia, and an early test flight of Spaceship Two. So that's a fatal accident rate of about 1%, which is terrible. And that's about 10,000 times more risky than the rate for commercial airliners. So again, we need to figure out how to make these operations more safe. And I think we're gonna learn a lot by, by flying a lot, just as we, as we did for aviation. But the, the third limitation I think we're seeing right now is just a, a lack of capacity. It's very exciting to me that, that just since last summer now, we have three companies selling tickets to go to space. SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, Blue Origin, and, and there are others that are working on it. And yet we, we have, if you look at uh, Virgin Galactic's uh, recent report to their Investors, they have like 800 people on the waiting list, and I'm sure SpaceX and, and Blue Origin have have similarly lengthy uh, waiting lists to fly. So, I mean, we're going to need more rockets. We're going to need more spacecraft. We're going to need more spaceports all over the world to allow people who think they might want to try this sometime the opportunity without waiting 10 years in line. And we have other companies like Space Perspective and Worldview are offering a different a lower price range, still expensive, but a low, lower price range. Yes. But the more, the more yes. of, of these, in the, these trips, the, the lower the cost, ultimately the technology is going to get better. The risk is going to get lower. And that's, and that's in, in general, that's the, the, the arc of every innovation. I mean, whether it was the cell phone or the computer or cars, or even credit that, you know, at the bank, you know, credits, people don't know. I mean, people, it's, it's a really long time ago, but usually just the rich people would have the opportunity to get credit. The people who didn't, who didn't have the fortune would not never be offered the credit. Now credit is offered everywhere. Everybody has a cell phone. Most of the people can take, you know, the plane to a different country. So all these innovate, these discoveries, these um, innovation at some point, were totally unavailable for the, the, the majority of the people, except for the very few. And it's the same, it's, it's gonna be the same thing with space, you know, in 10, 20, 30 years. 
how how long do you think that, that we have until there is there is a more accessible space experience? I, I believe it's going to continue to uh, grow and expand uh, very very rapidly, really. And again, just just look at the progress that's been made since last summer. And uh, so I agree with you completely. Uh, I think we are going to learn from experience how to design these systems and how to operate them more safely, more reliably, more cost effectively. And we're going to learn by doing just as happened in aviation. And so although we see some people being very critical of, especially the, the suborbital flights as, oh, that's, those are just joy rides. You know, why, why are we spending money? You know, these are not tax dollars. <laughs> it's important to recognize we're not asking for congressional appropriations for these kinds of flights to take place. But by gaining experience, we're going to learn what do we need to change? Where do we need redundancy? How can we make these better? How can we make it more reliable and less costly and so forth? And by having some revenues coming in during that process, it enables the company to continue to to grow and improve these systems such that they will be available for more and more people. And if, if people don't want to go on the, on the joy rides, that's fine. But we're going to find these systems being used more and more often for serious scientific and technological reasons, national security, all those kinds of things, in addition to the amazing experience that can have just by going up and, and looking out the window. The, the benefits of the science and technology that are going to trickle down to Earth by going to space are just absolutely incredible. Um, and I think it's hard for people to understand what is around the corner. Because one of the, like on Earth, there's not that much, that many incentives to, let's say, be really sustainable or to be really efficient because it's, the resources are really out there. You know, if you trash something, you just go and get something else. When you go to space, that atom of carbon that you bring with you is worth everything. And you cannot just go and open the door and throw your garbage out because this could be your food, this could be your, 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 your next piece of metal that you need. So that atom of carbon needs to be recycled, reused over and over again. There's going to be technologies of how um, to be efficient with the food that we grow and how new materials are being, are being built. And obviously the satellites that can help us predict the weather, work with the, the environmental world, the weather, all these, these assessments. I think it's, it's, I mean, you've worked in that industry for, for quite some time. You have a grasp of what is coming. How would, how would you try to, to, to convince someone that um, going to space is just going to be just this, this, this box of treasure, not this box of treasures, but this, this, um, this new revolution of innovation that's going to benefit Earth? So let me gently push back and again, uh, maybe try to change the, the focus of the discussion. Uh, maybe at the beginning, again, we had to have a, a president challenge the nation and have a national space agency whose mission was, was not easy, but it was hard. And that's why we want to do it. And it's going to cost us less money. And so you come go back to Congress every year for appropriations and you have a government bureaucracy that is trying to work fast and efficiently. And wow, we're at a very different tipping point now where we're seeing people not relying on the government, not using the latest government designs for space shuttles or space launch systems. They're looking at reusability. They're looking at flying once a week. Remember when the space shuttle was going to fly once a week? I mean, this is really an amazing thing. And I, so I don't, I don't think we necessarily have to convince all the voters that this is what the nation has to use our tax dollars for. But there's lots of good that can come out of it. So let's at least step aside, appreciate, enjoy if it's not for you, that's fine. But there's going to be benefits that come. And we've talked about some of them, but there's a lot more coming around the corner. I, I mean, as a possible example, I see the opportunity perhaps to have limitless, very low cost and non-polluting 
energy through solar power sat satellites. Don't know if that's going to happen and if we're going to decide to go in that direction, but the, the potential is there. The, the physics says, yes, it can be done. So it's a question of our, our priorities and, and what the constraints are on in terms of uh, carbon energy sources and all those kinds of things. Uh, as you mentioned, just the, the fact that you're limited in, your, in the size and the weight of the system you're flying on, it forces you to look for new ways to conserve and to reuse and to recycle. And going to the moon for long periods of time will stress that even further. Going to Mars, even more so. So I, I see a lot of potential benefits. One slight tangent, if you will, to, to this discussion, I, I see very soon, certainly in the next 10 years, a lot of the learning from the pure space activities being applied to what is referred to as point to point transportation through space. And so again, Elon Musk, SpaceX, they're building Starship to colonize Mars to be the human landing system on the moon. Great. Looks like it has a lot of capability for that. That system apparently could also be used to take several hundred people at a time from one side of the earth to the other in an hour. And think about how that could change things if it were not hugely expensive and it could be done safely and reliably. Again, bringing people together and allowing new ways to, to communicate, to travel, to do business, uh, that can easily be a, a spin-off or an application of some of the technologies we're talking about here. I often tell people, um, with this mindset of, oh, we should be focusing just our energy into one particular area and, and not put energy in other places. Um, I bring them back into the 1900s where uh, Tesla, Edison, and the Wright brothers are all kind of in that era. And the society at that time has a lot of issues, obviously, the, the, you know, the medical aspect of it, the, the the infrastructure of the society, you know, is, has issues. And it would, it would have been easy to, to tell Edison, Tesla, and the Wright brothers that it was absolutely pointless to try to power the world or to take the sky while there are diseases. I mean, why don't, why don't you be doctors and, you know, and try to go and help the people rather than do these things that are just seems to be so pointless. But the reality is that the world that they created elevated, created this new reality where a lot of the a lot of the, the, these issues were taken care of, and that's exactly what's going to happen with space. It's not it's not specifically wanting to just focus on one one elevation, but it's to create a new field and where these these other issues will be taken care of. Um, and and the, the technologies that are going to be brought to us are just going to help facilitate and give the tools. I mean, if, you know, I, I remember when the Salesforce commercial came out, you know, during the Super Bowl and you got Matthew McConaughey, who's, you know, now telling the world that we shouldn't be doing that. And in my head, I'm thinking, well, hold on a second. You're you're an actor in terms of spending your life doing something worthful. I mean, being an actor is not necessarily the most impactful uh, uh, a career in life, so maybe you should revisit your 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 choice. But life is so much more than a single issue strategy. You know, we have artists, we have philosophers, we have writers. We have we need collectively to elevate the dialogue and the human experience so that we can discover the unexpected. Because if we focused just on the serial, you know, narrow a narrow strip of, of reality, I think we would miss a lot of the discoveries. And I think the space is just, there. Uh, there's so many discoveries waiting for us, right? I completely agree. I think that's one of the magical benefits of, of innovation and uh, the kinds of things we're talking about here. Uh, but that brings up one, one other point I'd like to make, and that is that I think we've done a disservice to folks by uh, helping them think that 
to be part of the space program, you have to be a whiz at math and science. No one else need apply. But if we're going to achieve some of these grand visions, the millions of people living and working in space to benefit Earth and so forth, you're going to need more than test pilots, engineers, doctors, scientists. You're going to need technicians, welders, hotel managers, tour guys, artists, painters, athletes, all those kinds of people. So I guess my advice to people, if you are interested in space, if you are passionate about space, regardless of your education or your current job or the other traditional criteria, go for it because there's going to be a place for you in space. And I, I really think space is our future and there's room for all of us. It's absolutely, I was talking to uh, Patty Stoll from ILC Dover and we're, we're talking about how much the, the, the company is, you know, hiring new talents and a lot of engineers, obviously. But I said, what about the, the, the students who, who is right now in the Fashion Institute has absolutely zero engineering skills, but wants to get into this industry? Is, th is there a place for them? And she was like, absolutely. In fact, we need more. We, we need to, to focus on that human experience. Um, yesterday, yeah. talking to uh, the Rosewood, the GM at the Rosewood uh, Hotel here in, in Washington, who's going to be the first hospitality business company to maybe not invest into space, but lead the conversation of what is going to be that human experience? Because right now, yeah. That experience is like going and, and roughing it in the outbacks, you know, with, with freeze dry food and, and it's really not for everyone. But there's gonna be there's gonna be that that need of like, okay, we got the engineering aspect covered, we got the sewers, we got the, the, the plumbings and we got the electricity. But beyond that now, we need that richness of that human experience so that we can start moving more and more and not just be this like you know, really high and dry uh, experience that is not, not attractive for most of us. So we need these individuals that brings a different perspective. We need the artists, we need the, the, the writers. And I think part of the success of the Renaissance, you know, if we go back into the, the history, was for the Medici and these powerful people to see the value in hiring artists to create a vision of the future that, that went beyond the, the 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 knowledge of that play of that time and i think that the billionaires that's their res their, their responsibility is to to get those people who usually have different skills and create that v vision of the future right i agree and it's not just well it's my duty to um have some of my wealth go to these other people but there can be benefit it can be uh different ways of looking at things and uh can be a win-win scenario, so real synergy opportunities. Now, George, if people have questions for you, or if they're interested in following your your next your journey and and what you're working on, uh, can they go? I mean, are you on LinkedIn or do you have a website? Or how can they contact you? Yes, uh, LinkedIn is is great, and also try to do a little on Twitter as well. So. Excellent. So we'll make sure that the, the links are on the, uh, the descriptions for your LinkedIn and for your Twitter. Um, I think that you and I, we might see each other tomorrow. Um, so I'm looking forward for that. Uh, we can continue that conversation. George, thank you so much for taking the time and for sharing your wisdom and your experience. Uh, I, I greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. Looking forward for the next time. You bet.